a bit of a rough year. Um, you know, and uh, you're looking fantastic, though. How, how are you feeling? How's your energy? You know, I'm, I'm not sure how much you're sharing with the public or not, but, uh, you know, I know a lot of people have been concerned. So, yeah, no, I've been uh, no, I've shared it a lot. I've talked a lot about it in, in different in interviews like this and things. And uh, I like talking about it. Actually, it's kind of, you know, it's it's good therapy for me. I'm part of some cancer support groups. Um, the cancer I had was called HPV 16 squamous cell carcinoma. And I thought, how cool is that? I can drive in the carpool lane. <laughs> That's my first cancer joke I've come up with. So this <laughs> actually, Tom Kubis actually is the one that said that. He goes, oh, you can drive in the carpool lane. That's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, it's a very curable. You know, there's like a 90, 95% success rate with cures. What Michael Douglas had, uh, uh, some other friends of mine have had this actually. And it was a tumor here, an outgrowing mm -hmm. tumor. I didn't need surgery, thank God. Uh, when they told me I didn't need surgery, I just started crying when I was at the place. I thought for sure they were going to have to take my lymph nodes out and my career would probably be over. Right, right. That, I'm guessing. Uh, not necessarily, but it would be a rough road. So anyway, I, I finished my treatments a little over three months ago. I did 35 radiation treatments, uh, 7.30 a.m. Kaiser Sunset in Hollywood every day for seven weeks and and then chemotherapy throughout that. And uh I know it sounds like it was a blast. It really wasn't as fun as it sounds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, fun at all. anybody that's been part of this horrible club that nobody wants to be in, you know, understands. Uh, it's hard to explain how it makes you feel. Uh, but I, I weathered it all pretty well. And my doctor thinks he actually said, what effing planet are you from? <laughs> because uh, I never got a feeding tube. Wow. And, I, and when I told him I was playing, you know, midway through the treatments and my throat was like swallowing glass, you know, and because my throat mm -hmm. was all fried. And that's when he said that he goes, what planet are you from? You're playing the trumpet, you know? So I was well, I got to practice. I got to play, you know? So I couldn't play high. I could play a G on top of the staff and it hurt. So I just played soft, and played in the mute. And I just tried to keep it on my face every day. And I worked on my fingers and things that I neglect, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was a good time, actually, you know, like in hindsight, it's a good time to get sick. There's well, no yeah, word. and that's, that's, uh, I remember early on when you broke the news to me, you know, we were talking about how, you know, if, if, if you needed to get cancer, you know, you, you timed it pretty well, like the only pandemic in our lifetime, uh, when things were going to be mostly shut down anyway. So yeah, the, the timing actually, you know, in many ways, I'm, I'm, it worked out really well. So the industry shut down. So all my work went away when this thing happened. I mean, I just, I was getting phone calls like, like, 20 guest artist gigs went away. Right. You know, and you know, I charge a lot of money. I charge $150 for each one. So <laughs> it adds up. <laughs> and, uh, so a lot of money went away and then all my recording went away. I was supposed to go to New York City for a week to record with the Philharmonic and right. <clears throat> working on this movie that I can't talk about, but uh, it, it, uh, it rhymes with uh, left side Maury. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm, so I can't say what it is, right. and there's a lot of tritones in the score. Uh, so, uh, so that went away, and then all my recording here went away, and uh, and so I decided to take my pension <clears throat> on May first. Mm -hmm. And so you can't work for two months when you take your pension. Right. Perfect. Yeah. So I got paid, and then I went on disability as well, mm -hmm. and uh, so it kind of helped me out, and and uh, so money wise, it you know it helped, and and. Uh, in my, I get some royalty checks that come in July and they gave them to us May 1st this year just to help everybody out. And right. so it all worked out okay financially. You know, it made me feel comfortable. So I wasn't worried about work. Uh, I wasn't worried about not being on work. So sitting here, not being able to play and know that there's sessions going on. And as you know, in our business, man, out of sight, out of mind, you know, I like right. to think they can't do it without me, but, you know, they can manage to get it done without me. So I uh, like, you know, so there's just so many great players and, uh, I, you know, I don't want to be put out, didn't want to be put out to pastor. Yeah. So, uh, cause I am one of the elder statesmen now. I'm not that old, but I'm 62. And, you know, these young guys are coming up that are in the forties and they play great. And, you know, they're, you know, they're composers they work for in the business. And, mm -hmm. and that's great because I'm friends with all of them. And, you know, we all help each other out anyway. And, and, uh, which brings me to another point, I always treat the younger players when they're coming up really nicely because <laughs> you never know when they're going to come up and, be your boss, right? Exactly. And, I, and I've, always said, I've always said that even before I was working, you got to treat everybody with respect. And you never, you know, when people are young, and egos are raging, 
the, you yeah. know, you think you're all that and somebody coming up that's not as good as you, you might shun them or, you know, right. whatever. I watched it happen at Disneyland a lot when I was working there. I just watched all the egos at work. And, uh, and I wasn't, you know, I was an okay player, but there's a lot of better players there than me. And I remember some of them not treating me so well, mm. you know? And so yeah. going out, as I passed them up on the ladder, as the years went by, uh, I said, well, should it be an a-hole? Should I go to their level? Uh, but I do come down to step on their fingers on the ladder once in a while. <laughs> for the while just, uh, you know, no, but, but there's a lot of people that I'm friends with now. And, and I just equate it to, you know, ego and stupidity. And we've all done stupid stuff. And we've all well, been you know. mean. And we've all, we've, all, we've all done it. And we all hopefully learn from it. And, right. And getting sick like this has given me a new realization too because i'm a changed i'm a changed man in many ways you know i'm a much more emotional man which was interesting i start crying at the drop of a hat now for for stuff you know and uh and when i think about the outpouring of love that came into me uh through all this i mean i mean it was it was really I'm, now i'm tearing up now <laughs> crap um it was really something else man i, I gotta say there were just i had thousands of facebook's literally thousands of messages from people i didn't know from all over the world you know just trumpet people and but you know, know that that's the thing when with music is that um and, and you know this I, I don't need to tell you but you know it's it's <clears throat> I mean, when people listen to your music, I think they feel like they know you, right? Even, even, even though you don't know exactly who they are as the artist, you know, music plays such a, an important role in people's lives that, that you have these fans and, and, you know, in your role as an educator, the way you've touched so many lives that, that you, you know, I think a lot of people feel very, very connected to you and, you know, have a lot of gratitude for what you've both created musically, uh, educationally, and in finally, just as a great human being, you know, uh, it, you know, you're a, an amazing person. You've touched thousands of lives through through the different aspects of your career. So it's no surprise to me that, uh, that you had so many people reach out to you. And of course, we're all just really happy that that the outcome was was as excellent as it is. And it's yeah. great to uh, see you looking great and and uh, sounding great. So, yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. You know, I it, that, all, those messages carried me through this. And I read, I, as I've said before, I read everyone. I read oh. everyone, man. And I tried to like or love everyone. You know, there was, there was too many to, to respond to, you know. So it carried me through. And, uh, and it makes you realize how small our music community really is, you know. And you're right. We do, you know, to, I feel like I know musicians that I've never met, you know. Right. I, love yeah. I feel like Al Jarreau is my best friend because I... Mm you know, and Stevie Wonder, because they're like my favorite artists of all time, you know, and I listen to their music constantly. And uh, I would, uh, you know, I would have loved to have met Al Jarreau, which I never did, but I did get to meet Stevie Wonder a couple of times. And, uh, yeah. and so, yeah, you, they, it really, the music really does touch a lot of people, even, even in our small limited jazz community, you know? Yeah. So um, anyway, yeah, that stuff uh, made a big difference for me. So I'm not really out of the woods yet. Um, because I won't get a PET scan until uh, November 9th. So it's coming mm -hmm. up. And uh, like I said, the odds are very good. Right. Uh, you know, uh, it's a very curable cancer. But until I hear those words, hey, we don't see anything. We'll see you in three months. Yeah. I'm not, right. you know, I don't rest well and uh, thinking about it. And I had a weird dream the other night, not to go on about this too much because, uh, uh, but the tumor was here, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was going through radiation, you know, I could feel on the table, I could feel this thing vibrating and they were going, really? And I go, I'm telling you, I can't, you know, cause they're frying this thing and they're, right. they're frying over here. This thing's going around you and it's, you don't feel anything, but it's, it's burning, you know, you get sunburned. And, and, right. Right. And then the other day I felt in there and I felt a little bump in there where it was. Uh huh. And I was like, Oh man, I don't remember feeling that. Uh, is yeah. it growing again or is it, and it was a dream oh uh, it was so real right I, I didn't even realize it till the next day in the afternoon i went to feel it and i went i was dreaming that yeah, yeah. so that kind of stuff is happening to me you know at the moment which is you know not good i'm just trying to you know whatever happens happens and whatever we have to do next we have to do next i mean i, I you know i want to beat this thing and and uh Terry Warburton, I don't know if you know who that is, but he's, yeah. a, he's a mouthpiece maker and he makes trumpets. Mm -hmm. And we're old, old friends. I met him when I was working on cruise ships when I was 21. And he had this exact same thing. And he's three years out in the same treatment program. 
Mm -hmm. except just to show you how much tougher he is than me. Now he did have to get a feeding tube, but he drove himself two hours every day to Jacksonville from where he was living to do his treatments. Wow. And let me tell you, you don't feel so good. Right. And after you do oh, it a couple up. of days later, you're sick. And then the radiation's frying your throat. And then he drove himself every day. My wife drove me, my wimpy little butt here, 25 minutes because of COVID, no travel. Every day she drove me. And then when we were going in, because I would get, I was very depressed. I don't want to go in there and do this, you know. Right, right. I'm wearing my mask and I'm doing things. And she would play the Rocky theme <laughs> every day. So I hear, dun, 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 dun. I'd be walking in, I'd be going like, and, uh, and when I came out the last day with my mask and all my certificate and stuff, she was out front playing that for me. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. It was really uh, quite a moment. So anyway, enough about cancer. Let's let's talk about something happy like politics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about something fun. Uh, actually, if those are the choices, let's go back to cancer. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> if those are the choices, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, let's 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 definitely dive into to uh, some some music questions, and yeah, yeah. and maybe that Rocky uh, theme was a great segue. Y you know, I I think the first time that that I became aware of you uh, was uh, when you took over the that lead chair in Maynard's band, and. Um, you know, I, I <laughs> to play in Maynard Ferguson's band on any instrument, you know, I, I just can't imagine what that would have been like. And of course, I, I know, you know, very close friends with so many of you that had that opportunity, uh, you know, Bissonette and and uh, geez, all these guys, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. all the trumpet guys. Uh, but 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 man, I mean, to, to not just be in Maynard's band, but be in that lead trumpet chair. Talk about pressure. I mean, what was that like when you got the call for the gig? And then I would love to hear. You know, I mean, probably the greatest of all time, one of the greatest. I don't know. I would love to hear your take on his his rank in the the trumpet pantheon. But uh, you know, what was what was the biggest lesson that you took from that experience? Well, I'll give you. A, I'll just tell you how I got on the band. First of all, we'll start there. So in 1984, I was on the road with a soul singer, Bobby Womack. Yeah, Bobby. Okay. And uh, and uh, you know, we were in London at the time. Uh, you know, Bobby had a hit, Patti LaBelle had a hit song on Bobby's at the time. So all of a sudden our gigs got better. We went from clubs to stadiums opening for Patti LaBelle and we ended up doing a tour in London. And we were at the Hammersmith Odeon in London for a week and we went to Manchester. We did a, a, a tour of uh, the UK. And uh, and while I was there, I got a call from Bob Wackerman, who uh, at my hotel, they found out where I was and before cell phones and all that. And he was playing bass uh, with Maynard at the time and Alex Hiles was playing trombone and, and uh, they were looking for a lead trumpet player. And uh, and I'm, I go, I can't, I mean, I'm on the road. I wanted to do it, you know, and it was like one fourth the money I was making, you know. Right. I wasn't making a lot of money, but maybe, you know, these road bands didn't pay much. And uh, and so I had to say no. And I was like, and I just couldn't believe it. I go, I just said no to Maynard Ferguson's band. I can't, I was like kicking myself in the head, but there's nothing I could really do, you know. Right, right. And uh, anyway, and a year later, and, uh, 1985, uh, they'd replaced the lead trumpet player, or he left, I'm not sure what the, the term, terms were. And uh, and I got a call again to go out the beginning of the touring in 1986 and the beginning of 86. So I was able to do it this time. And I was living in a little apartment in Huntington Beach with my first wife. And uh, that's a whole nother masterclass we can do with him when you stay with my first wife and <laughs> start going through, anyway, we'll talk about that later uh, privately. Um, uh, and I got some gig tapes to, to Reverend, and they'd sent me a copy of the book and, uh, and I got some cassettes to listen to the show and, and kind of learn it. And before my first rehearsal, which was going to be in Ojai, California in uh, early January, uh, practice the stuff, kind of got it down. And, uh, I really didn't, you know, I was going, oh, this is going to be fun. You know, we got to that first rehearsal and I hadn't, you know, thought about Maynard really that much because I, it wasn't the kind of music I was listening to at the time. Maynard had gone like another direction at that time too, which I really wasn't that into, you know, and right. I was listening to Count Basie and, you know, and, and Lee Morgan and, you know, other, other stuff. Right. That I'd gotten into and uh, funk stuff that I really like, you know, and uh, it wasn't so that for her, for her. So we were there and I was meeting everybody and I knew some of the guys, I was meeting everybody for the first time and in walks Maynard Ferguson. And it hit me like I went, Oh crap, man. There's the guy that did all that stuff. <laughs> there he is. There he is, man. And 
he could not have been cooler and welcomed me to the band. And uh, I'll tell you uh, just one little story about that. So we're playing, we're rehearsing and Maynard had just had hernia surgery. So he was kind of taking it, taking it easy. And he was listening to me play and checking me out. And he was walking, we only had five horns, two trumpets, bone and two saxes. And he's walking over and he's kind of checking me out. And, and, uh, and we played this tune called Central Park, this funk chart, funk chart and it has this horn solely in the middle of it, just, just horns. And it's got some echo plex on it and stuff. And it has a double high C on the end. It goes, and then the rhythm section comes back in, you know. So uh -huh. here's Maynard standing like five feet in front of me. And I'm going, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nail this thing, man. I'm gonna bring it, you know. And so we get there, and I it's probably the best I'd played it in any time practicing. And I had the solely memorized, you know. And, and he cut the band off and he goes, ah, uh, uh, Wayne, uh, Wayne is it, right? Uh, he goes, uh. Uh, is that all you got? I'm like, oh my God, you know, I'm thinking it's just like, and he started to like, ah, he goes, oh man, you sound great, man. Welcome to the band. You know, everybody laughed, you know, so that was my first words to him kind of other than saying hello it was our first right. interaction. Right. And, uh, and we went on to be friends and I stayed friends with him till his passing. And uh, he kind of relied on me to, to, we put a big band tour together in 1988. He relied on me to put the brass section together and, and he brought me in for a couple of other records when they fired a lead trumpet player or second trumpet player or whatever. And I just come and fill in. And, right. and then I played on his final CD, you know, as a guest. And, and uh, so it, what an honor to say, oh yeah, Maynard was my friend. You know, it's like, I, I look pat myself on the back. Oh, that's pretty cool. No, that's, that's about the coolest. You know, and, and for somebody that was like such a mentor and many, especially when I was young, you know, I just, of course we all, idolized the ground he walked on you know or you know sacred ground man Maynard Ferguson or you know any of those people you know Buddy Rich or Count Basie we idolized all of them you know so uh that's a time in my life I wouldn't trade for anything it's probably the least amount of money I've ever made playing and it's the highlight of my existence in many ways because I got to have that experience with so many young people won't get now because those kind of things don't really exist anymore right he was kind of the last man standing as far from he really Maynard. was he really was I think oh. I, I think Maynard I, that was the uh you know I'm a I'm a I'm a couple years behind you uh Wayne and a little bit younger than you how old uh, are you how old are you are you 40 I'm 40 so 40 47. 47. I'm 40. 47. Okay. Well, you look great, man. So you. <laughs> Thanks. You as well. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, you, you know, I, I think uh, I only had the chance to see a couple touring big bands. I mean, they were all done by the time I was out seeing shows and Maynard's was one of them, you know, and it, and it wasn't like, you know, at a big jazz festival or at a big concert hall. I, I saw Maynard's band at like at a, at a high school. You, you know, get a lot of high schools. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I, I was doing the math and I was thinking, man, there's there's no money for those guys to get paid. This is a labor of love. And it certainly was. And you could tell from the music, you know, so. I was making just to tell you what I was making. So in 1986. I was or was it the 88 tour? No, I think it was 86. I was making five hundred dollars a week and I was the highest paid person on the band. Wow. Because uh, I was a li I was a librarian and I assisted the crew. I wanted to make as much money as I could. So I did extra. So after the gig, uh, when when people would be going out to hang and stuff, you know, I had to get the books and right and put them in the case and, you know, make sure all the parts were there and then go roll up cords if we provided our own PA. It was nice when we were in a hall where we didn't have to do any of that. Yeah. We had our own PA system for high schools and stuff. So I'd have to schlep. And that right. would take an hour, an hour and a half after the gig. And everybody was done hanging by that time. So, well, uh, that you know, that brings up uh, another question I've got for you. And then we've got some questions from uh, some of our <clears throat> students here, actually several great questions I want to pitch to you. But um, but before we get to those, you know, talking about money. So, I mean, you know, you bring up an interesting point, you know, that was maybe the highlight of your playing career. Uh, it was a time that you, you wouldn't have traded, but it was when you were paid the least. Um, you know, talking about where you're at now, you know, considered by many to be the greatest studio trumpet player alive right now. And I think you've got the uh, the credits to back that up. Um, you know, where where do you find that that uh, balance right now? I mean, is, are you still at a place where some of the music that you maybe enjoy playing quite a bit doesn't pay as much as, you know, as there as there music that's paying the bills, uh, 
versus some that's maybe not that you enjoy. And, you know, and, and, and do you ever worry, you know, does a musician today need to be worried about being accused of selling out? Is that even a thing? You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I sold out a long time ago. The first time somebody paid me to play the trumpet, you know, I, I played at a bowling alley for five hours and made $20. And I was like, damn, I just made $20 playing the trumpet. <laughs> you know, it was like the greatest thing ever. So uh, I worked at Disneyland and I wore purple tights and that's not selling out. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what is, you know, but I, you know, I never looked at those things as selling out or anything. I looked at like, I'm getting paid to play. I'm around a bunch of great musicians. You know, a lot of people that worked at Disneyland complained about their time there. They thought it was stupid. Not everybody. I mean, but I had fun, man. You know, I did Christmas parade there and we do the camaraderie, man, and the, and the friendly competition amongst all these trumpet players that work in there. At Christmas time, there's like 30 trumpet players there. Right. Classical players, jazz players, lead players. All We all got our new mouthpieces and stuff, man. It was really a fun, <clears throat> great, com- and, and many of those people, I would say most of those people I'm still friends with to this day because of that and so was it selling out you know working at a theme park well making some if you know i could have been doing something else i could have been you know trying to sell cars or or worth something not very fulfilling and so right. I'm playing my trumpet and i'm practicing and I'm, and i'm learning from all these players that were better than me mm-hmm. there's a lot of great players there that that uh that i looked up to you know one of them unfortunately i'm gonna he just passed away uh a guy named gary Halipoff. And, and it's, it's a little interesting thing because he was dating my wife, Deb, when after we split up, they got together and it was never uh-huh. a thing. It was always cool. He's really great to my daughter. And he just passed away a couple of weeks ago. He had a heart, heart attack and I won't go into uh-huh. details of that. And and uh, I just recorded a little tune from him called Gone, Gone Too Soon that Tom Kubis wrote that they're going to play at his funeral. And and uh, and he was a great he was the player we all looked up to. When I first started working there, Gary Holopoff was that guy. They went, oh man, Gary Holopop. There was a couple other players as well. He just, he had a thing, he had chops. He was a great musician. He was a nice guy. And, and uh, it's very sad that he's gone, but there's many players like that that I looked up to there. So I wouldn't trade that time for anything as well. So uh, in the studio business, I mean, if I was a true artist, <laughs> you know, I would say, oh, I'm just going to play jazz or I just, I like big band. That's all I do, man. And well, I, you know, I wouldn't have a house. I wouldn't have health insurance. I'd, I'd be, yeah, wow, great, man. I'm a, I'm an artist. Well, you would have a lot of free time, though. Uh, yeah, I'd have a lot, of, but I, you know, I'd be eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and maybe I'd be in one of these tents out on the, on the highway that I see here under the freeway overpasses. You know, so, uh, so I decided I wanted to make money playing a long time ago. But it's all art, no matter how you look, no matter what you do. If you're entertaining in a funny way, that's like saying, well, comedians aren't artists, right? they're joking and, and so that's what you did at Disneyland and, and that's what I do when I do guest artist concerts I try to incorporate besides playing some music that people might like I try to be funny and I try to be entertaining and I want to engage people and uh well and our, our, our our mutual friend Francisco Torres you know I mean I love what he says which is you know you know it's like we need to remember that as musicians we're, we're whatever kind whatever style of music we're playing we're part of the entertainment business whether that's classical music jazz you know, rock, pop, whatever it is, it's entertainment. And so we want to engage and connect. And, and, and the point is to make people feel good. We're not building bridges when we play music. We're not building a house. We're not curing cancer. We're helping people have better lives, right? To be happier, to, 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 to share emotion. And so I love, I love what you're saying about, about that, about bringing the entire package and your whole, and, and you're so great at that, Wayne. I mean, that's one of the reasons I've been a huge fan of yours from the time we met, you know, because I feel like, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your commitment to, to the f- full package as an artist, not just the music, because I think being an artist encompasses a lot more than just notes and rhythms, you know? It, it really does. You know, and I learned a lot from watching Jack Sheldon, uh, I played in his band, and watching how he introduced the players, mm. and how he counted off a tune, and what he would say about the tune, maybe. So he would, he'd do a play off the, the tune, the name of the tune or something, and tell a story. And so... I kind of like started thinking about that. I go, well, you know, you don't want to be the person who goes, and the next tune we're going to play is this. <laughs> okay, here we go. Two, three, four. And then not introduce any of the soloists. Right. And you see that time and time again. And, and I've seen it at master classes. And even though the, the clinician may really have great stuff to say, it doesn't convey 
right because they, they don't know how to deliver their message and uh i've seen a couple the last gen conference i went to and i'll i, I won't say who the player's name is because one of the greatest uh not trump a player but one of the greatest players on the, their instrument that i know and the master class was the most boring thing i've ever seen in my life and people were walking out right because the person couldn't finish a thought and they couldn't you know they just don't you know so it's it's a learning curve to learn how to do this my first master class is i had to have notes up there yeah i had an outline and i'm sure it was very boring but then it got to the point where i go man i know i know this why do i have to have these notes here let right. me just wing this and let it go where it goes so in my mind, I have an outline, but no matter if somebody throws a question at me, it's going to throw me off. Now I'm prepared for it better. So I feel like I'm better at it now, for sure. Well, and yeah. Yeah, and it does just come with practice. I know uh, John Whitman, <laughs> our mutual friend from Yamaha that uh, we both work with, uh, he gave a session at a conference recently talking about becoming a great clinician. And he said, step one is Boy. go do about 200 clinics for yeah. free. Then and then 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 you're ready to you know to to do that as uh, something you get paid for. So you le you learn about how to do. You definitely definitely true because all the audiences are low. sometimes you have a young audience. Mm -hmm. You have elementary school band kids, right? And you have college kids in the same thing. So how do you address all of them? Yeah, you have to you have to bring in the young kids. So you have to play a lot. You have to play. You have to You have to get their attention. Play something that they're gonna like. Right. You know, play a high note or, or whatever, you know, something, you know, kids, you know, they go nuts when you do a shake or something. So it gets their attention. They get all giddy. And then you can talk about how you do that. Right. And how you and develop that. You know? And that, again, it's all part of the artistry. And and that's the reason, you know, why uh, just because you're a great musician doesn't make you a great educator and, and vice versa. So uh, right. it's one of the reasons that uh, I think you, you've you had such a great impact, um, you know, is because you have focused on, on both of those things. Now, I, I, I've got a, uh, we do have a great question here. We got several, I want to get to these before we run yeah, out of yeah, time. Yeah, so um, one, one of the, uh, one of the things that, that I was always impressed with Wayne, like I, I, I was following your playing, you know, I, I mean, for, for, for a long time. And uh, when I first became familiar with your music, I, I recognized you as this amazing lead player. I don't think I, thought of you or and I don't I don't know that the general music population thought of you as a as, a, as an amazing soloist improviser and then um, over the years you know your solo chops have really developed and become fantastic and you know that was all showcased on your on your uh, uh, critically acclaimed solo albums that you put out um, you know and so I, 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 I as an educator and a musician I know that those things don't happen by by accident that I'm imagining represented a lot of shedding time. Um, and I think a lot of trumpet players, you know, put themselves as either a lead player or a soloist and very few try to tackle doing both of those things. And we've got a, we've got a question here from one of the students from Monique Reed, who said, how do you know what your biggest musical weaknesses are, what you most need to work on when you practice? And to me, it seems like that was something that you were able to do is kind of, and I see you do it through your entire career, hone in on places that you want to improve and then, and then dramatically push that forward. And I don't think you've ever stopped learning. I mean, would you agree with that? Well, I'm still, you know, I still take lessons from different people from time to time. I took a couple of lessons just recently. One with a guy named Burnett Dillon, who's a great all around, but mostly classical trumpet player that's retired now, but he was a good friend and going through this stuff with my cancer stuff, you know, he showed me some stuff. We did a little Zoom lesson and I, I took a lesson with this gal the other day, Jan Kegerice, uh, who like deals with people with chop issues like focal dystonia and stuff like that. I wanted to get her take on, you know, as I put myself back together, I'm playing and I'm doing okay, but I'm still recovering, you know? Um, so you, I mean, your weaknesses should be pretty obvious to you you know, no matter what you do, you know, if you play basketball or you play baseball, it's pretty obvious what you're not good at. I can't catch the ball or keep hitting me in the head. Okay. I need to work on catching the ball because I'm getting a headache, you know? So for me, I'm very aware of my weaknesses. And when I was young, I had really great band directors, but my first trumpet teacher at that time, he was right. He said, well, you either play lead or you play jazz. You know, there's not many people that do both. And, there, and he was right, because there really, there really wasn't a lot of people that were doing both. I mean, there's a few, you know, uh, but 
so I just concentrated on playing lead. I was a lead player in my high school jazz band. And yeah, it's what I liked. I liked, you know, I saw Buddy Rich's band. I loved the, hearing the lead trumpet in those band and Count Basie's band. And so uh, I, that's all I worked on. You know, I tried to play a solo on band and I, you know, I didn't know the difference between a flat tire and a flat nine, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you can only play the blues scale for so long before people start going, hey, you don't have much information, do you? You know, so then I heard Bobby Shue play with Louis Belson's band. And I was like, well, wait a minute. He's playing lead and he's playing jazz as good as all the jazz trumpet players in the section. Then I met this guy, Joe Davis, who was a great, great lead trumpet player from here that unfortunately committed suicide years ago. Probably one of the most impressive players this town has ever seen amazing chops and an amazing jazz player and so i started working on it a little bit not real seriously but started thinking about it and trying to transcribe some solos and learn some licks and try to put them in keys and, and then i played out blues i was you know it was a little bit more convincing you know so the years have gone on and uh when I did my first solo CD, which was kind of a challenge, I was never planned on doing a solo CD. I did three tunes because I go, man, you should do a CD. And go, ah, it's, you know, how many old Holy Night charts can you do? You know, right. you know? And they go, no, do some, you know. So I had to listen to this chart on Waltz of the Flowers for me. And Tom Kubis did this rhythm changes uh, chart uh, called the Rhythm Method for me. And uh, and a tune called Hospital Blues. So I had these three three charts and I went in and I recorded them and uh it came out pretty good you know I really worked on the tunes and the changes and I kind of had my what I was going to play worked out you know just to be perfectly honest you know this is you know 2003 right and, uh, going, Man, this is really great and I'm going well it is okay I mean the band sounded great and the charts are great but I just thought I was inadequate compared to everybody else and so we went in and recorded another three tunes and another three tunes a year later and and i had nine tunes done you know people done some different charts for me and we put that cd out and and lo and behold i got nominated for a grammy i mean i just couldn't believe it you know but it, it kind of it launched me into some guest artist work it really did having that calling card so i started getting called to these things so i had to learn how to play these charts convincingly in front of people and maybe not play the same solo every time right <laughs> so, right so i started working on things a little bit more and and uh and i find even though i rely on some licks and things you know i'm playing live things that get the audience's attention i you know i'll rely on some of those things at the end of a thing but i truly do do try to play a lot of different stuff i've learned a lot i think and, and marrying barb catlin who's one of the best you know jazz educators on the planet uh, you know, I have a built-in, you know, faculty here at my house, play, you know, really well. And when she hears me practicing and playing the same dumb stuff all the time, she... This key here. And so I go, okay, and so I start working on that. Go, there you go. Now you know, you know, you know what you're doing. So I, I'm a constant work in progress, and I still am. I've been transcribing a Till Bronner solos lately, and I don't know if you know if Till's playing, but he's a German trumpet player and one of the most lyrical trumpet players on the planet. So I'm, I'm going at it, you know, still and trying to get better. And so yeah, so you uh, the, to answer the question, you know, you need to you need to go after your weaknesses for sure, and uh, yeah, and use your time, you know, accordingly. You know, we have to warm up, we have to do all these things, but if your attacks are weak. going fa fa you know huh? that's happening every time well how do we fix that you know so you got to put some more tongue on it maybe you know you know you do that and well that's too harsh okay i can't tongue every note like that so maybe i'll try a softer syllable like da and get the note to start right away and we experiment with that you know, we make the mm -hmm. aperture smaller and we do these different things to make the front of the note more elegant. Now in jazz, you know, we throw a lot of that into the toilet. You know? <laughs> you know, 
there's nowhere in the Arben's book that says that's a good attack. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when we're improvising and we're playing things, those things are sounds found in jazz. So we, we need to know how to turn those things off and on so we can be versatile and convincing. Right, right. Oh, you're frozen up, Kayla. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but you're frozen on my screen. So I don't know if it's your connection or mine. Jaden, uh, which I don't know. Can you uh, yeah, see, uh, who's um, the weak I, one? Mine's also which Wi Fi things here is going to disconnect us, right? Say that again. Yeah, my, mine's uh, being slow as well. Okay. Oh, sorry. So we got some issues. All right. Yeah. Well, but you can hear me, though. So that's, you know, yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So if that um, answers that question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we got another question from uh, Truman Harris, uh, who said, what, what were some of the things you did that helped your career take off? Like what kinds of things uh, did you do to, uh, to get noticed when you were, when you were first starting to play? It's well, uh, it's kind of a, the putting the cart before the horse. Uh, you need, uh, you, there's not much you have to say or do. Um, because, you know, I know a lot of musicians, trumpet players, especially that just talk about how great they are. Oh man, I'm so great, man. I nailed that double high C. Oh man. I'm so, man, I am so it. Well, usually those players are not it, you know, mm. in my experience, uh, it's the, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't walk into a gig. You don't have to say anything. All you have to do is put your horn up and play what's in front of you. And everybody's going to know exactly where you're at, at that moment. You know, no matter where you're at, and you never know where your gig's going to come from. So that's why you have to take every gig seriously. No matter where you're playing, if you're playing at a wedding or whatever, you can't fart it off. And you know, you got to play the best you can play. You never know who's in the audience and go, man, listen to that trumpet player or that saxophone player. Wow, you know, and they're a music producer <laughs> or a contractor. Man, you sound right. great. Here's my card. You never know. So, uh, you know, self -per promotion there's nothing wrong with some self-promotion don't get me wrong if you can f create a venue to be heard if it, if it means putting a band together and playing in a coffee house for, for you know for free even though i don't say for free but i don't like playing for free you know or do i recommend it but they put a chip jar out whatever but it's a venue to be heard possibly and you'd be surprised how those kind of things you know and so if you feel like you have the goods my, my next thing would be uh, whatever kind of work you decide you want to do, you know, you need to go to a town where that work exists. You know, you can, you can go to Dubuque, Iowa. It's a beautiful place, but you know, if you want a music career, pretty unlikely you're going to have a music <laughs> career in Dubuque, Iowa, unless you play in a symphony or something, you know what I mean? It's just a, so Los Angeles or New York or, you know, London, you know, they're the big meccas, you know, and, and those are shrinking because of a, a lot of reasons, you know, so uh, but I would listen with somebody from that town. I would find the most working person on that instrument and I'd go take a lesson. And for a couple of reasons, to learn something. And also, so maybe if I feel like I have the goods so they can hear me. And I've had a couple of trumpet players come through here that have taken lessons right out of college that were really, really great. You know, I mean, really great. And I was able to recommend them because I heard them play and I called Gordon, hey man, this cat, you know, Pete DeSiena, I don't know if you know that name, but he went to UNT and he's a great guy and a great lead player, real quiet, quiet guy for a lead player, you know, very unassuming person. Some of the most effortless chops I've ever seen. In fact, when he came over to take a lesson, I learned more than he learned because I'm watching him play and I'm going, man, this, how do you do that? You know, he goes, I heard inside. I don't show it on the outside, you know, so. Wow. His answer to that, but he sounded great. And I called Gordon Goodman immediately. I said, hey, this guy should be on our sub list. He can read, he's got chops, he swings, he's got complete tech engine. So he started subbing with the band and became one of our main subs. Then he started playing with Bill Holman's band, he got heard. And then he took my spot in Bob Florence's band when I left the band. And uh, and then he went on and started doing some stuff. Unfortunately, he moved out of town. His wife got a really great job in, in New Jersey, so he moved. So I don't know what's happening with him now, but he was really a great one of my favorite players to play with, you know, it was really, really great. So, but that's, you know, I was able to help him and that's how that can happen. That's one way that can happen. Uh, yeah. But it's never happens with going, Oh, Hey, I'm such and such. And man, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm better than such and such that you use now. 
and I see that happen a lot, man, with all the face bragging on Facebook. I call it face brag. You know, of everybody and you know, they are, and it's it's unnecessary. The all we have to do just play, and we'll we'll everybody will make their decision on, you know. Uh, well, and there's it. so I, it's, I, and I, I I'm sure you found this. Is that fine line? Yeah, there's. I, I just uh, I just don't think there's ever a uh, a benefit to pushing others down to move yourself up. That's never going to be a, uh, a, a positive in your favor. It just always weakens how you come across. It never, it never works. It might work temporarily. It, it might work temporarily, but at the end, there's always, even if it's years later, it always comes back around. Yeah. You know, so that's back to like treat everybody with respect. And, right. and if you're, if you're a young player and you're 16, and you're just, and you're it, you know, in your age group, nurture those players that aren't as good as you and help them and show them what you know, you know, yeah. and that's, that's how this should work anyway. I mean, it's a loving community in the music business and we make it too competitive, I think. Right, right. Um, and another question here that's great that I think you're uh, uniquely qualified to answer uh, Wayne, uh, Sebastian asked, what skills unique to studio playing should young musicians develop if they want to get into session work? And I think, I think this, uh, this becomes even more right now. I mean, as we've moved into this COVID era, um, you know, even though the technology has been there for home recording for professional artists for a long time, it's really kind of made it the norm now. And I don't, I don't think we're going back ever to the big studio sessions, you know, on the scale that we had before. Such so can just be done as you've been doing from home, recording everything. That I think the the ability to record yourself, to be a studio musician, to have those skills, are just kind of going to be required for everybody playing music at this point. Wouldn't you agree? I definitely agree. And I've been saying even before COVID, I've been telling people to get into recording technology. You know, and uh, for me, I, I was ahead of the curve here. So when this happened, I was up and running. You know, I got good mics and good mic. I got a nice setup here, you know, and putting out some quality stuff. So I was, you know, for shows like Family Guy and World of Mickey Mouse and shows like that that I've been doing, you know, we've been doing sessions for. We've been doing them from here. Animaniacs Reboot, which is a new, we just finished the first season. It's going to be, it's going to be coming out uh, in a month, I think. The first season is going to come out. And uh, I don't know if you remember Animaniacs, but it's, it's the new Animaniacs. Right. And it's, so we've yeah. been doing it from home. And uh, on Family Guy, I, I would do all the trumpet parts. And uh, on some of the other ones, we all, like the different trumpet players are doing it from home without being able to hear each other. So somebody has to go in and edit all that later. You know, somebody's got a little pitch discrepancy. So we actually do, you know, I'm not a big fan of staring at a tuner, but I use a tuner here in my studio because I know other people, I got to make sure that since I'm playing by myself, that I'm somewhere in a relevant place pitch wise and not going sharp, you know, because uh, you don't have a chord to ring to, you know, you're just playing by yourself and you're playing with synth tracks that are dead on, no tempered scale. So we put the, they put the parts together later and I, I haven't heard any of it, but they, I'm hearing it sounding really great, you know, so, uh, but I think, I, I do think we will come back that we already started here in LA. Uh, I've done several sessions back at Fox Studio, which is reopened. We have, to, unfortunately, we have to do them separately. So the breath section will go in on their own and self, you know, we're, we're baffles and spread far apart and the strings will go in on another day. So that is starting to happen. Um, don't you think though that, uh, that, that there's been, um, I mean, there's a, a, a much higher level of comfort with people recording from home though, right? And so there's probably going to be uh, some of that that continues even when things open up again. Oh yeah, oh, I definitely think so. Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the smaller projects that are being done this way, that are coming out great, people are gonna go, well, there's no reason for me to go spend thousands of dollars and go into you know, Warner Brothers. You know, it's a small thing. We can do this this way. There's certain things, you know, there's nothing like a big string section in a big room with the room mics. It doesn't matter how great your technology is at home. It's never going to sound that good. Right. You know, but for pop things and a lot of the things are doing it, I mean, right. a
Oh, you're muted, Wayne. Here we go. I'm back. There we go. Did, did uh, we lose everybody, or we just lose me? I don't know. I got. I. 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 I don't know what happened there, but but I can see you now, which I wasn't able to before. That's yeah. Cool. I just went onto this extended network thing I have too. This little plug-in thing that uh, you know, so maybe this will be better. Um, yeah. So yes, where we were. Uh, where did we leave off? We were talking about uh, the studio stuff, and you're mentioning oh yeah, that. yeah, yeah, the home studio stuff, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, a lot of this will stay around, and I'll and I'll continue to do stuff here and uh, my own projects as well. I'm doing a play along, music minus Wayne kind of thing, big band. Uh -huh. So I've been recording all the trumpet parts here, and then you'll be able to take the first trumpet part out, and be able to take Andy Martin's part out, and Salazano's. We're doing a whole uh, all public domain tunes charts that Kubis did. So I've been working on that, and it's good practice for me too. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's the norm now. I felt special before. Now I just feel like, oh, everybody can do this now. And I showed several people, you know, like Alex Isles and Andy Martin and this bass trombone player, tuba player, Steve Trapani. They knew, you know, all of a sudden this happened and they were panicking. Oh, no, I'm going to be obsolete. So I had to, I said, well, go get, you know, go get the latest version of Pro Tools and buy this mic and buy this mic, you know. So I kind of got them up and running and I made little videos for them. And I'm not an expert by any means, but I, I, I know a lot more than they know. So, right. uh, you know. Well, and, and that, you know, that brings me to my next question, Wayne. It's like, you know, uh, peering into your uh, uh, Wayne Bergeron, Wayne O Crystal Ball here. Uh, you know, what, what parts of the music business return to the way they were and, and what, what, to your best guess, changes rolling forward uh, in regards to, I mean, we talked a little bit about the, you know, the session work. What about live performances? Well, you know, and obviously we're just guessing at all of this right now, but, you know, you're right in the, in the thick of it right there in, in Hollywood. Uh, you know, what, what, do you, what do you guess is going to be the future of, of live performances uh, uh, I think, I'm, I mean, I think live performances will come back, but I, I'm sorry, I cut you off there. We got this delay. So I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I think it will come back to some degree. I don't think it will ever come back, you know, full bore. I just don't think so. Um, this is the industry's chance to save even more money. And industry is not kind with money necessarily, you know. <laughs> They're always mm -hmm. looking for a way to pay less and they're finding it in this. They're going, man, we're getting this good product this way, you know? And so for smaller things, you know, it's not, it's not necessary. I mean, unfortunately what we do is like, the, I like to think it's the most important thing in the world. Like you said earlier, we're not curing cancer. We are not that necessary. Uh, I mean, I think the arts are very necessary, but a, a lot of the fluff that goes along with this, you know, having a band at a wedding, which is great. It's easier to have a DJ. They can play exactly whatever you want at any time. If it's too loud, they turn the knob down. You know, I've been on, you know, when I used to play weddings, I've been counting over the band was too loud. They complained about having the band there. Right. It's not a practical thing unless you have a huge event. You know what I mean? And so I hate to say that, but it really isn't a practical thing. And I understand that from a, the, somebody to having the wedding you know i had to complain at my wedding my second wedding which is another master class from the video <laughs> I uh i had to go up and tell the band they were too loud i did and i just felt like such a schmuck as a drummer who i didn't know that it was in new jersey and this you know right this idiot you know oh. A lead trumpet player telling the band to quiet down. I love it. And so I said, hey, man, you guys sound great, man. I go, I go, don't shoot the messenger, you know, and I, I just thought it was funny to me. And I go, but it was too loud. Or it's dinner music. And the drummer immediately copped that. He goes, all right, oh, guys, Ipanema, here we go. You know, <laughs> and I'm like, really? I go, by the way, I'm paying you. If you'd like to continue getting paid, you can just <laughs> cut the attitude now or go home because I don't care right. if you stay. I actually said that. You can right. go home. Right. <laughs> You know? oh, man. so so i i'm i i complained about the band being too loud so i mean things like that i don't know whether they'll come back or not i i really i really don't know i think broadway uh will come back as soon as you know when this thing clears up it may start with half theaters yeah in full they're going to probably come up with some kind of cut and pay for everybody right you know, which is sad, you know, if we fight for these clawing and scratching and fighting, but you can understand their point. You know, if they can only fill half of a house. Yeah. 
you know, uh, it, it, we we do have to kind of work together as a team in some way. Right. Even if it's I mean, with the, even with the people that have screwed us in the past, you know. Right. What do you, what do you think about the future of 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 symphonies and operas? A lot of them are uh, you know shut down right now, and we're bleeding millions before this. That do, do they survive? Uh, do we, you know, what, what, what does that look like? I think the biggest orchestras will survive a lot of small orchestras and opera companies and things like that will go by the wayside, unfortunately. Um, it's even, even here because of this AB five, because of this, you know, thing where everybody has to be a, right. an, employee. an employee. It's mm -hmm. unfortunately, it, it was this blanket thing and it really hurt freelance musicians and small opera companies, things like that went under because of it, because they can't afford to pay 30% more. To payroll right. everything so it kind of sucks and uh you know it doesn't involve it doesn't affect me that greatly because all my work is i have a corporation i you know so my stuff is very different i'm not a freelancer like that anymore but it really sucks for those players and, and uh, it's, it's a drag so uh so lot, that's hurt a lot of things here and then this covid thing is the double whammy on all this and you know maybe you know maybe when we clear up maybe in two years when we feel like everything is normal it will slowly come back maybe yeah. you, know, these, you know i i only hope for that i hope for all of that i want everything to be normal again you know like we all we all do well and and you know we all want it to be normal and um but you, you know uh talking to a lot of our students here at soundhouse and and uh other musicians you know I, I mean, that's the thing I keep hearing is, well, well, when it goes back to normal, when it goes back to normal. And I, you know, I encourage everybody to start to think, well, it's, it might, it might not go back to normal. You know, the airline industry, uh, you know, for those of us that are a little bit older, we remember what it was like to fly before nine, when it's like after, you know, we, we've never gone back. We've never gone back to flying the way we did before nine 11, but right. we've all adjusted and it's just, life goes on, you know? So yeah. I just think we need to be open as musicians to the possibility that things aren't going to go back exactly the way they were. That doesn't mean they're not going to go on. And, uh, and there's always, uh, I think there's always going to be a huge need for arts, for uh, entertainment, both. And, and for us as musicians, both of those, I think, go hand in hand. Uh, and, um, I think there's going to be a demand and, and enjoyment that comes from playing music. That's never going to go away. Uh, and so, uh, that also means that there's going to be some opportunities for musicians that didn't exist in the past. This isn't all doom and gloom. There's a, there's, there's a future for this, and it's going to be probably a little bit changed future, which means that for those people that can, can find some, some new ways to connect, to express, to create whatever it is. Uh, there, there's opportunities uh, to continue, uh, you know, being successful, uh, whether you're playing music just for enjoyment or if you're looking to pursue it, uh, you know, as a career. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, even before COVID, these changes were happening, like bands like Dirty Loops. Yeah. They just put themselves out there in this, in this technology-driven, you know, world we live in and became this thing from that you know and so the thing you know the music it, it's been changing anyway this is you know changed in another way and this will evolve what, what we're learning now about technology and recording from home and all and, and trying to be entertaining from home will evolve and right. uh, i think the next step will be when you mentioned orchestras will be uh when they can get on a stage uh and social distance and have a big enough stage it maybe there'll be some live streaming con i mean who doesn't want to see the cleveland orchestra you know, if that was ten dollars, and man, and there's this Cleveland Orchestra concert tonight, man, I'd be sending my ten dollars in and watching them play mm -hmm. live. And it's going to be like that for a while, and it'll be a way for them to make money and and uh, and and help the, those groups survive. I know a lot of the big orchestras, the LA Phil, I think, is on a they're still on salary, but it's may, maybe they're at fifty percent or sixty percent right. or something. You know, um, which is great that the orchestra is doing, but that's not sustainable forever without them yeah. doing something so i'm sure that maybe some of that's been happening i'm not aware of it it has been with jazz concerts like in clubs and stuff uh mm -hmm. so eric marienthal played the baked potato a few weeks ago and i paid my 10 bucks and watched this great concert you know with my headphones on and on my computer here and and but you think about that putting on a concert like that uh 
and make it a worldwide thing and, and it's ten dollars or eight dollars to do it and and ten thousand people do it well that's a substantial amount of income coming in right you know so it's it's going to be the next step i think because people are starved for entertainment and wanting to mm -hmm. see things that they love so maybe some rock maybe dave matthews band will do that you know, yeah and they'll go nuts you know uh, say they want to see dave matthews band so they perform in a it's a small enough band where they can social distance on the giant stage and have great four camera shoot and and uh and watch their watch a live concert right you know until you pay from home though you know so that's so, it'll go there next i think well um i i i think it's going to be really exciting to watch and and hopefully uh you know maybe you and i can chat again uh six months or a year and kind of see where things are at a time but you know we're not on a strict schedule and before we leave i just i wanted you to comment a little bit about uh just because you know in addition to being a musician and an educator i also spend a lot of my time as an entrepreneur and a business owner and uh that. you've had a lot of success recently uh with your mouthpiece line and i i i just uh I, i'm always excited to share stories with our uh musicians about opportunities uh to kind of create uh, different revenue streams uh, for those that are wanting to have a career as a musician. Uh, and I was hoping you could just share just a little bit uh, about how you stumbled into that and uh, what kind of an opportunity it's turned into for yourself. Uh, it's, been, it's been pretty amazing, actually, I have to tell you. Um, when I started playing these mouthpieces, there are GR Tech mouthpieces, Gary Radke, and he's in Deuceman, Wisconsin. And, uh, and I ended up on his mouthpieces on accident. Uh, I'm just going to tell the very quick story uh, so we don't get too long-winded. But I was in Japan with Gordon Goodwin's band. I had just recovered from having a cyst on my lip. And you remember this. I, couldn't I play do it. remember that. I was there so, when, when it so started. I went, I went through some hell. And I had to stop playing for six weeks. Well, I came back. And, you know, the cyst went away. I went to the doctor. And I had, you know, took steroids and got a cortisone shot in my lip. I did all that. I did, even did that in... Salt Lake, remember I went and got a shot. I do, do. I do remember. Yeah. I couldn't play, uh, couldn't make a sound. And uh, I came back from that and I played a show here in LA at the Pantages Theater. I played uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And, uh, and it wasn't too hard of a show. So as we played eight shows a week, my chops got stronger and stronger and I started feeling pretty normal. My next gig after that was Japan with Gordon Goodwin's band. Two shows a night for five nights. Hardest music ever written. Right. <laughs> dead room. The Blue Note in Tokyo is a dead room to play in. And uh, I was in trouble three tunes in. My lips started hurting. And my old mouthpiece was this Marcinko, it's mouthpiece, but I kind of have a sharp rim on it. And uh, by three tunes into the second set, I couldn't play. I couldn't make a sound. And I told the band uh, manager, who's a fourth trumpet player, I said, hey, I'm going to have to go home. I can't afford to hurt myself again here. I'm not ready for this. Uh, we'll get Eric Miyashiro or somebody to to cover for me while we're in Tokyo. The guy subbing on for Dan Fenero is Willie Mario. He goes, well, what does that feel like? I go, my, mouth pe my mouthpiece feels like a razor on my lip. And he got into his mouthpiece pouch and he pulled out, pulled out a GR mouthpiece. He goes, hey, this is something my student of mine gave me. I don't, I don't really like it, um, but it's got a really cushy rim, really soft rim. And I go, well, let me see it. And I put it up there. And and it felt really funny. I was like something I was not used to. And I go, oh, wow. And I, I went to play on it and I went, bop. And I made a sound. And I went, <laughs> bop, bop. And I hit a high C. I go, what the heck? I mean, I couldn't make a sound. And uh, it was bigger, you know, so. Right. So anyway, I played a couple of third trumpet parts on it. And I had a couple of high Ds and I was playing them no problem. And we played Rhapsody in Blue and I played that solo and it felt great. And as that set went on, and this is no lie. This is a true story. As that set went on, I got stronger and stronger. And by the end of that set, I was playing stronger than I've ever played. Wow. And Gordon is looking back at me like, dude, what happened? You were just done. And all of a sudden, you're, <laughs> you're killing it here. Now, it wasn't without its problems. There was some accuracy, accuracy problems. And But man, I had I could play. You know, So I was excited. So I got through the week. And uh, I was trying to learn the mouth. I called this guy from Japan. And he asked me what model it was. I go, well, no, there's some scribbling on it. I can't really tell. And anyway, it turns out it was the Carl Fisher jazz model. Mm. And Carl's a, you know, somebody I've known for years. He was a kid. Yeah. 
And uh, he goes, you're playing lead on that? He goes, that's the biggest backboard I'm making. I go, well, I don't know what it is. I go, but I think you just saved my career and we need to talk. So when I got home, uh, I told him what the problems were with it, you know, on certain notes and stuff. And he had five mouthpieces waiting for me for me to try. You know, he wouldn't tell me what they were, warm up on this one and then tell me what's right. all what. So we went through this process and I eventually went and visited him and we dialed in the mouthpieces, which I play now, which is based on that right. initial thing. It was completely different from what I played before. And uh, so we decided to put the mouthpieces out. We will put out one model, we'll put out the lead model, we'll call it the studio. Said, how many you want? I go, well, let's make 20 of them, I guess, you know. Well, the first day they went up on my website, I sold 20 mouthpieces in one day. Right. Like, we need more. <laughs> and so we ordered more and more and we kept selling them. And then we decided we came out with a whole line. You know, we came out with something a little deeper that somebody wanted something a little more room. Came up with something more classically based. We came up with some flugelhorn and piccolo trumpet. And, uh, and it's been, you know, this has been several years now. And I think we've sold over 1,500 mouthpieces. Oh, my gosh. Which is, you know, a lot when you're talking right. about a mouthpiece, especially a specialized mouthpiece that's kind of a weird rim. It's not for everybody. Right. You know, right. It's, it's, if, if you would have given me this when everything was fine with my chops, I would have gone, oh, please, I can't play this. But it does kind of the moral of the story is different can, different can be better. So don't disregard something that feels completely different. It might be right. better. For me, it was. And for a lot of players that have bought this mouthpiece, mo I don't see a lot of them for sale after they've been sold. I mean, a few here and there, but most players ad adapt to it and end up really liking it. And the cushy rim, I mean, I never feel like I'm hurting myself, no mm -hmm. matter how hard I play. So uh, it's kind of a good good thing. And so um, anyway, it's been a very successful, and most players that have gone to it have found some benefit and it's been an improvement over what they're playing. I would say most players, cause I don't know. And it's a weird, just weird. So I didn't plan this as a business man or an entrepreneur, but this rim being unorthodox and a little bit weird. If you like the lead mouthpiece, a conventional, once you get used to it, a conventional rim doesn't feel quite as good anymore. Right. So now, you, now you need the flugelhorn mouthpiece with the same rim. Right. <laughs> or you need the classical mouthpiece with the same rim because you're used to this now because everything feels sharp after this. So I didn't plan it that way, but it's 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 made repeat sales. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wish I had a thought of that. Maybe that's, <laughs> it's, but it's, it's worked out okay. So when we continue, I mean, they're not selling like crazy right now because of the COVID thing, but it goes in waves and all of a sudden I'll, Seems like every time I talk about it, I get a mouthpiece sale. So maybe let's me check my email. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> It'd be funny if there was one there. No, no mouthpiece sales. But I'm selling some, you know, I'm selling some, uh, I sell CDs and I sell Gordon's books. And I did this book with uh, Greg Fishman from Arizona, these etudes books. So I'm selling those. Uh -huh. and stuff. Kind of generates a little income on the side. And, you know, so little side business well it's uh it all it all adds up though right i mean it all yeah. like all the puzzle pieces come together and and make it so uh these careers are viable yeah, um, teaching teaching too you know people you, you teach you know and we and we sell things and we out here i do mostly i play but i those things help you know right right and for sure and uh and having this technology at home as you know as your kids are all learning they're all going to be smarter from this. They're going to all, you know, when they go into recordings too, they know what's going on now. Right, exactly. They've been using Logic or Pro Tools or something going, they go, hey, I know what that does now. Well, even myself, you know, I mean, I've been working around for years and years, but just had somebody else do it. Now I've had to get my hands dirty and get in the mud and I love it. You know, it's so much fun. And uh, so just the additional tools and, and flexibility that we all have access to. As I love doing it. My first thing I get up because I'm recording all these little projects. I get up, I have my coffee, my wife's still sleeping. I put on my headphones and I get into these tracks and I listen to what I recorded yesterday and I make sure it's cool because they're going to be isolating my lead trumpet part. So I don't want any, I don't want anything I, that's not first rate in there, of course, you know, I'm not going to yeah. leave a, on a record. I might leave a clam. You, you won't hear it, you know, right. And it's part of the beauty of, a. but on this kind of thing, they're going to be isolating my part. I want them to hear the, the thing. So if there's a little clam, I might go fix it or grab another take, you know, better take from somewhere. And I get in and I listen to everything and I, and that's kind of my tinkering with my coffee. That's in my morning. That's what I do. Yeah. 
it's fun. Well, I think, me. you know, and that's, that's, uh, as you know, Gordon has been uh, running some bands for us and he and I have talked a lot about this, you know, because in uh, running the sound house bands that are entirely online, they're all, um, you know, we've, the thing that we've learned in this process is that, you know, when we were running in-person rehearsals, we were preparing for a live concert. Now that we're doing this format, we're rehearsing still, but we're preparing for a studio recording, which is a different, it's a different performance. A studio performance is a different thing and you prepare differently than a live performance, which I don't think I, you know, I really thought about until we were actually doing it. And so it's, it's, been, it's been great to understand the difference in what our objective is and the difference in preparation for that. And that's exactly what you're talking about, you know, for yourself, I think. Yeah, that, that's true. I'm uh, one thing I just want to say, I'm really sorry that I haven't been able to be involved. You know, when I, got <laughs> sick, when I got sick, you know, I thought I didn't know how sick I was going to get. So I thought I'd still be able to run a band. But as Gordon let you know, at, first week into chemo, I was like, I'm not going to be able to do this. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, no, we 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 totally understand, and you are involved. You're here with us today, so. Yeah, yeah. And I did play. I did play first trumpet on one of the tracks from one of the. You games. did. You the did. The trumpet player dropped out, you know, so <laughs> so I got to be involved a little bit, and but anyway, I'm bummed because I was really looking forward to it, and and talking about being an entrepreneur, man, you like looked at this thing, when all this tragic stuff, and you said, okay, what can we do here? We got to do something, man, and that's what something I really admire about you, man, is when the chips are down, you find you find something to do, man, and you find a way to do it. And, and all of a sudden there's new software, man. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to have these bands and man, and, and it's really, really cool, man. And I admire you so much for that. And I know I've told you that before, you know, but uh, the world needs people like you for sure. Well, and, and you as well, we'll, we'll do it together. Right. So <laughs> I like to say one of my favorite lines is you can turn chicken poop into chicken salad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, thank you very much. And Wayne, uh, we, we did run over, but I, I'm so glad you shared your experience with the mouthpiece. And uh, for those of you watching this either live or uh, later on in our vlog, uh, you know, by all means, uh, get on and, and uh, get, get on a wait list for Wayne's mouthpiece. Chances of being able to order them out of the gate are uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes better than others. But uh, if you can get your hands on one, definitely would recommend that. Yeah, so, and if you have questions about it, you know, you can contact me, you know, through my, through Facebook or my website or whatever, if you have a question about the mouthpiece or, or something, it's not for everybody. I'm not, you know, certain people coming from this mouthpiece are not going to like my mouthpiece. And, you know, I don't want anybody to buy something and not like it. I want it to be used. So, but if you wanted to buy one, just as a charity kind of thing. I'd... <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, they're, they're amazing. So they're excellent um... paperweights too. You know, so. <laughs> well, I know, uh, I know the vast majority of our, uh, of our super band trumpets uh, here have been using it uh, for the last few years. So thank you. For oh, that's that. awesome, man. I'm glad. I hope they like them and I hope they're, it's they, they do. And, they absolutely do. And, uh, and, you know, and we evolve as trumpet players, you know, I mean, I'll, you know, as I get older, I'll probably be changing my design at some point yeah. to accom accommodate my age and, you know, my health issues, you know, like Bobby Shoes done that his whole career. He's, He's right. made equipment more efficient and we, we do need to do that, you know, so. And that's, that's part of, uh, you know, part of the process for this whole thing. But, uh, well, we are out of time, Wayne, but uh, once again, first of all, uh, so good to, to see you uh, smiling and, uh, you, man. and uh, on your feet and all that. And uh, we of course wish you all the best and uh, praying for very positive results for your PET scan coming up. Thank so you. thank you for that. Prayers accepted. <laughs> keep, keep me in the loop on that and, and uh, all your fans, but, and thank you so much Wayne for taking time this morning to uh, visit with us, share your experience, your knowledge. And, uh, and definitely we're, we're going to keep you very involved here at Soundhouse, where uh, you got a million, million fans here. So thank you very much. Thank you to everybody watching and, uh, and hopefully we can get together and, and, play together soon and Jaden who's taking care of our technology here we have to thank him even though we can't see him, absolutely right? yeah Jaden Jaden is a godsend and uh, has been uh, just a fantastic asset when it comes to all this technology implementation here at the sound house so Jaden thank you uh, as Wayne said once again for getting this all set up and for those of you joining us uh, attending and and uh, sharing your questions thank you very much Wayne will be in touch soon and uh, everybody else thanks for joining us 
uh, with our Sound House House Guest Series with Wayne Bergeron. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Thanks Caleb. everybody. Thank you, Caleb. Right. It's great to see you. Take care. Bye-bye.